Want to know what your dog is thinking? Have a challenging dog behavior you need help with? The Dish on Dogs is your source for all your canine questions. Improve your relationship with your dog and deepen your understanding of your furry friend right here on the Dish on Dogs. Welcome everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Dish on Dogs. I'm your host, Mike Gould, affectionately known as Mayor of Houndstown, USA, home to the happiest dogs on earth. Fortunately, I am joined again by the very recalcitrant and lovely <laughs> Jackie Bondanza, my co-host. She's going to be here guiding us through what the Dish on Dog is all about. Uh, this episode, what we're going to talk about is the mammalian brain, I think. So, yep. Jackie, thanks for j- uh, joining me once again. Of course. Part of my job, you know. Mm. Couldn't say no, literally. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. All right. <laughs> Leave the jokes to me so we all laugh, all right? Um <laughs> So the show is about the dish on dogs. Obviously, I'm the mayor of Houndstown, USA. You're the president of Houndstown, USA. And since our inception, we've taken care of probably close to 2 million dogs now, definitely 1.5 million. And, you know, we're very proud of that fact that you, our staff, our franchisees, we're franchised now. What do we got, like 30 locations in 10 states? What the hell's going on with this? Yeah, we're growing really quickly. Uh, we are currently open and operating in 11 different locations in, t- in four states, actually, New York, New Jersey, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. But this year, what about we're going to- North gonna... Carolina, Orlando? Well, I'm getting to that. Oh, this year, we're going to be opening locations right. um, in Las Vegas, Orlando, uh, Palm Coast, Florida, right. Right. North Carolina, another Pittsburgh location. So we're really, really, right. we're, we're exploding, which is really exciting um, for us and right. our, our pet care system. Right. So that's, what, yeah. So I'm very proud of our franchisees. We'll talk about that another show, I'm sure, an episode about franchises. Absolutely. Yep. But so, so the fact is, we have done this for a very long time. We've taken in, as I said, 1.5 million dogs. And I attribute it to the fact that we spend a lot of time understanding the animal brain. Yep. Our competitors, because they are human, and they probably, frankly, have a more developed human brain than mine, certainly, not yours, of course, but they really are academic thinkers. That's what our, well, that's what the human brain is. Mm-hmm. It allows us to be, listen to music, write music, play music. Animals are mammalian brain that we share with a dog is the same mammalian brain that animals have or very close to it. They can't do any of those things. They can't play music. They can't go to a play in New York City. They can't study fine art. These are complicated things that only really lie in the human brain. And that's what separates us from dogs and animals. Right. And we understand that. So many of our competitors or just people in general or our customers for that matter, I don't mm-hmm. want to focus on our competitors, just people. It's very difficult for them to remove their human brain and to think as an animal and see the world as a dog does. Right. And that's what we specialize here at Houndstown is right. understanding the dog brain. Um, and, uh, you know, with your extensive background in canine management, law enforcement, um, you know, scent detection, uh, understanding dogs from a dog's perspective of the world. That really informs everything we do here at Houndstown. And we talk a lot about what the topic of the show today is going to be, the difference between the dog brain and the human brain and the importance in understanding the differences between the two in order to foster uh, a greater relationship with your dog and in order to understand your dog better, which is ultimately going to make his life better and it's going to make your your life better too. Right, right. So the challenge always is, is our brains, our human brains are very, it's probably, it is the most complicated organ in the universe, the right. human brain. And even psychiatrists, neurologists, anybody who studies the brain will tell you they're only scratching the surface of it. There's so much depth and unknown about the human brain. Right, that and it, its it, capabilities, And its really. capabilities, yeah. right. So we sometimes talk about different... Uh, uh, autism. We talk about autistic servants. We talk about different things that uh, are in the human brain sometimes, and we wonder why and how. And humans study that all the time. As you know, our good friend Temple Grandin, mm-hmm. who wrote the very uh, famous book, best-selling book, Animals in Translation, 
she discovered or she decoded the mysteries in her view the mysteries of dog behavior few her through the her eyes which is autistic she suffered from she suffers from autism at a time i wouldn't even call it suffering i think it, in my view it's a gift actually. oh absolutely yeah so when we talk about disorders uh, or, or normal brains and abnormal. I have done over the years work with autistic children, blind children, deaf children, and I find them gifted. So I, right. I, well, I, I think they have a greater gift at connecting to things that people with a different type of brain, d d d they don't have that ability right. to connect because that brain tends to be more analytical. So, so Temple Grandin in her book, well, she's written many books, but Animals in Translation is a fa foundation for our knowledge and, and kind of how we think about dogs and treat dogs here at Houndstown and across our pet care system. I think that she, she describes, you know, as being autistic as, as the foundation of her gift to understand where animals are coming from better and to help bridge this gap between um, really her work started out in uh, like agriculture work and farm work and oh. helping farmers understand how to more humanely treat animals. Right. Um, so and, and that that is, you know, we come from this from kind of a science, the same type of scientific background uh, or philosophies and how we think about right. dogs here at Houndstown. Right. Kind of, right. So I agree with everything you said, but again, once we start becoming scientific, that's where the human brain and the animal brain separate. So what she had learned and what she had validated for me, things I've already known. So as I, we've said before, I've worked with dogs and law enforcement and searching for different things. And I started to be fascinated by the dog's ability. Everybody could relate to the fact when you're getting close to home, your dog's in the car, or you're getting close to Houndstown, you could be a mile away and the dog gets excited by it, right. even though he can't see anything. So right. uh, last and night- And why is that though? Like people, because right. we, we just had a customer in the lobby uh, say that to us, like, uh, you know, their dog came in super excited and, and the, the customer said to us, my gosh, like this dog, every time we turn the corner, the dog gets so excited. Um, and of course, they make that connection that they're getting excited to come to Houndstown. But from the dog's perspective, how does the dog know right. that he's approaching something right. that he likes? No, but that's a good question. So our human brain could only try to guess and we think that they know directions or they feel right. the car making a right turn or left turn. But the truth of the matter is, and this fascinated me 20 years ago, I used to drive home uh, from work with my police dog. And every time I approached a certain exit, he would get excited about a mile away from the exit. So my that, that's when I became analytical. I'm wondering why is this dog doing it? So was it me slowing down? Was there a dip in the highway that right. signaled to him this is our exit? Was, again, my signal? Was it the change of my speed? What was this? So I try to outsmart him. So I would speed by the exit. I would do all kinds of things to throw him off. And from every approach, whether I came from the north, south, east, or west, the dog would get excited. And he's not looking out the window. Yeah, right. I just did this with Rosie last night. She has no legs. She can't see out the window. But she knows. So the simple answer is it's an environmental odor that is so every, everything has a scent signature or a fingerprint. Right. Whether it's things that are odorless. So when we talk about finding drugs, heroin, if you asked a pharmacist or a scientist what does heroin smell like, they'll say it's odorless because our nose can't detect it. So right. it's odorless to us. But it, to a dog, it's not. These elements in the environment are not odorless. Right. They are, in fact, very powerful. Right. And they're navigating their world by scent more more than by sight. So Completely. So they're getting triggered and cued by odors in the environment Absolutely. that we're unaware of so we talk about a scent picture it's not one thing right so dogs see the world through their nose and that's why in law enforcement i would say they give us x-ray vision they could see beyond wall they can't see beyond walls they can but smell they can beyond smell walls. beyond walls right. exactly so that's why they're so uh efficient in finding i could take a piece of, i remember doing this little experiment at the suffolk county police headquarters i took a little piece of c4 explosives and put it in a vending machine in the cafeteria. So think about that. A P a C4 is, is odorless, another odorless substance. Mm -hmm. It's an explosive. One of the substances we train 
police dogs to just find. Just put a disclaimer out there. You were hired to do this. You didn't go into a school. Right. I'm not the Unabomber. <laughs> no, I, I was hired to do this. And I was kind of, we, we my partner As a safety and I, training exercise. Well, we were training the dogs to detect odor. Okay. And when you want, want to do that, the important element is we're training them to do it. So we had to, they had a disregard. Think of all the odors associated right. with a cafeteria and a candy machine. Right. There's all the different odors, uh, the, the bleach that the, they're cleaning the floors with. But the point is the dog was able, so it looks like extra sensory perception. Within two minutes, the dog could walk into this cafeteria and alert to this little piece of C4 explosives that really looked like a, like a chocolate bar. Because he's been trained to identify that scent. Right, right. And he's obviously not looking, he's not searching for explosives. He'd never go to work if I woke him up every right. day and said, we're going to look for bombs. Right. So he was just searching for the scent that he says to the human, hey, I think this is an anomaly. I think this is what you're looking for. Okay. And then, of course, it's up to the human to decide, to is it a chocolate that. bar or right. is it a piece of C4 explosives? But I think my big, the biggest point, we can't understand dogs because we don't have that ability, right? right. You can't. So, uh, you know, we talk about a dog being able to break down odor. So if there is a pot of stew cooking or whatever you're, you're making, chicken soup. I like to use chicken soup. So you might be able to smell chicken soup and say, oh. That's chicken soup. That's chicken soup. A dog can break down every ingredient. He yeah. can break down the carrots, the chicken, the broth, the pepper, whatever the ingredients are. And that's what's so fascinating. And when we talk about understanding a dog, just think about that. Just look at a dog's nose compared to a human's nose. Right. Much Two, longer. Right. Much more. Two-thirds of its brain is devoted to not only taking in odor, but separating odor right. and categorizing it. So when we talk about the human brain and the dog brain, it's not that dogs are stupider than us. They actually, they can do things that are fascinating. What well, They're almost supernatural things. Right. So yep. they take odor and in their nose, they break it down and their entire nose, as I said, two thirds of their brain, two thirds of our brain, I think probably are dedicated to visualizing things and processing things with our eyes. Or right. Eat. Right. So... So, so that is what I'd like to just, again, it's not that complicated when you think about it in those terms. Mm -hmm. So everybody that comes in, when you let your dog outside to run around in the backyard, particularly in the morning, if it rained a little bit or there's morning dew, your backyard now is like a florist shop for the dog. It's the same backyard to you. You look outside and you say, okay, maybe I need to cut the grass next week. Right. When the dog goes out there, especially the moisture on the vegetation, on the grass, it lightens up. It's like you going to a florist shop or you going to a museum. So you can see that in your dog. Open the door. They'll run out and their nose is on the ground. They may smell the rabbit that was there last night. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty fascinating. That's what fascinates me. Uh, obviously, the average pet owner doesn't have to be obsessed with that, that type of thing that I am, but they can at least understand that they're dealing with, as I said, uh, no different if you had a two-year-old child that couldn't hear or see. They have, they're have they using different senses. Right. Well, I think... I think it's interesting to if people for people to just think about that and to change their perspective about how they're thinking about their dog. We're such visual... Right. We're a visual species, and the dogs are not. They're right. se they're sensory, um, olfactory, right. species led species. So but, I think when we talk about the main differences between the human and the mammalian brain, that's probably number one, right? right? But let's, if we can, let's go back to the beginning when we were predators that did hunt. And we did need these resources. We right. don't anymore. Well, we, we've just evolved through it. We evolved. Yeah. We evolved. But if you look at, again, you, if you look at a human's head or skeleton, their head, it, 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 it's, it's similar. We're predators. We're carnivorous. Some of us are. At least we're carnivorous biased, and so are dogs. They're not herbivores. They're, right. just, they're just not. And this is when we talk about biology. We, you know, we can be herbivores, and we think that by giving your dog carrots and lettuce, they're going to live longer or live a happier life. I don't necessarily agree with it because they're, that's unnatural for them. Right. They have their canine teeth that they rip meat apart. They swallow things whole. So there's a lot about their anatomy that's similar, and there's a lot about their anatomy that just hasn't evolved. Right. But yep. I think one of the most important points, if I may, if we think about what is natural and what is unnatural. So everything for a dog, 
who is the same as he was for the last 20,000 years, he doesn't understand. So it, what's natural to a dog is dirt, right? Because that's dirt's been around forever. Right. Uh, trees, vegetation, a stone, rocks, those, that's natural. More natural elements. You right. Know. So now we include all, we include swimming pools. We include mirrors. Dogs don't understand mirrors. They don't even understand glass. So when you see a dog going ballistic trying to kill your mailman, it's not because they want to kill him. They just doesn't understand that it's, a, they see it as a predator. Right. And they bark and bark and bark and the predator disappears. So these are all the things that we talk about that get the dog out of balance. Right. And then, I mean, this is a kind of another topic, but using the mailman example, when a dog is kind of allowed to free roam in a home, right? And right. the owner's out or sometimes the owner's home when this is happening and the dog goes crazy at the glass door or the window when the mailman comes to drop the mail off and then the mailman goes away so i know you always talk about that behavior gets reinforced because the the perceived predator on the dog's part the mailman is leaving so right. so that reinforces the dog's behavior that okay my barking and going crazy is helping to eliminate this threat right Right. And very frankly, humans have taught that behavior. Right. And so the human reinforces it by not correcting that right, behavior. Right. If the doorbell rings and you start yelling and screaming and try to restrain your dog, you're putting conflict and anxiety in the dog when it doesn't exist. Right. So as I always say, if a dog grew up in a doorbell factory, it would never respond to the doorbell. But the humans are doing a ritual. Obviously, they have to answer the door. But a dog doesn't understand anything. They hear a cue is a, a, a bell ringing or, or a car pulling up, whatever the cue is. And then they look out the window or start barking at the door. When they start barking at the door, the door opens, which a door, they don't even know what a door is. It's just right. a breach in the wall. And right. then there's always a human on the other side of it. Right. And I, there's always some sort of drama that drama. upsets the balance and not necessarily a negative drama, but it's somebody else. It's a change in their environment. When somebody right. comes into the home, when somebody leaves the home, there's right. always drama happening at the doorway. Right. Created by humans. So Created dogs are humans. undramatic. Yeah. They're either, here's the simple way of looking at it. Right. Dogs are either safe and secure meaning your dog 80% of the day, 90% of the day is laying on the couch, it's laying on the floor, laying in your bed, wherever it is. It's nice and relaxed. It's not out of balance. Right. There's a cue or a trigger, usually a doorbell or a sound. You know, I always talk about the, you know, the animal shelters. If you drive by an animal shelter at 3 o'clock in the morning where there's 100 dogs, you wouldn't even know the shelter's there. I can kind of de de defy people to do that. Go right. drive by your local animal shelter at 3 o'clock in the morning. You won't know it's there. The only time you're going to know it's there is when humans appear in the morning right. or something's happening. So at the root of every problem, and you know we deal with dog bites by, you know, in in court we testify, you know, about dogs mauling people, especially the bully breeds. I've never ever testified once and put the blame on the dog. It's always at the hands of the human. Right, always. and many times it's it's not intentional on the part of a human it's just a misunderstanding oh, on completely. how to properly manage an, a dog which is an animal it's a predatory animal that right. we have now in our in our homes and um so, so this is why we believe it's so important to understand how dogs see the world wh what the differences are in their brain and our brain so yeah. that you can protect them, ha give them you know have a better understanding of where they're right. coming from and right. kind of what their needs right. are and so, so the biggest difference is that dogs use their nose to navigate the world, and we as humans are more, way more right. visual. But and I think as a secondary to that is that dogs really see in pictures and shadows, and this can kind of talk a little bit about that and how that affects very common behaviors. Like we get calls from people that say, "My dog barks at you know bicyclists going by right. and motorcycles and people with hats right. on," and right. then they tend to make the connection that something must have happened to the dog right. related to that uh, right. bicyclist right. or person. Right. So, so you, right. talk about that misunderstanding right. a little so bit. So most human beings rely on their human executive brain to diagnose behaviors that are very simple that they can't, it's almost watching a magic trick. So when I do these, you know, do the behavioral work with dogs, I talk about it as, um, it looks like magic because people are like, wow, how did that happen? How did you get the dog not to pull on a leash in two seconds? 
And again, the difference between a magic trick and what we do is we show the trick. It's very simple, and it's kind of what you alluded to. We need to be the leaders of a dog. So dogs are social, structured, pack animal that require leadership. We get them, and there's really no defined consistency or defined leadership. We, so we just look at them as children growing up. So we treat maybe our, our, our dog like we would a five or six or seven-year-old child. But understand that the dogs are, and again, what you said is right. So a dog uses all its senses to put a picture together including its pads, its paws. So dogs are very sure-footed. If they put their paw down, for example, this happens pretty commonly, if they put their paw or pad down on a nylon carpet and get a little static shock, which happens completely, it happens to us, right? We walk across a nylon carpet and open the door. If the dog experiences that shock from just gently touching its pad, they'll make that associate that will last for a lifetime and it will be very difficult sometimes not always very difficult so then it becomes a fear so dogs are connecting these dots oh yeah very sometimes very quickly and and they're forced to make these connections to under make some sort of understanding about our human world because they're right. animals and that we're we're bringing them into a, a, a lot of human we're, elements we're, we're, so we're, they're making these connections and connecting the dots yeah, and right. and i think sometimes that creates fear and what we may look at as uh a bad behavior in a in a dog completely and we'll probably over the course of these shows talk about these little as i say you know we talk about dogs that are very social that never bit anybody but if a dog is lying on the couch and he's guarding a, 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 a cheese doodle that nobody sees, and a child goes to pet the dog. It could be the I've seen this, so it's not a, this is not a figment of my imagination. We've had a very social uh, five-year-old Labrador Retriever who stereotypically are the most friendliest dogs in the world, which they're not, by the way, necessarily. And a child goes up, a strange child who wasn't is new to the the environment. It could be a neighbor, a relative, goes to pet the dog, and the dog bites him or snaps at him. And everybody then goes into a state of panic. They're crying and the dog attacked the five-year-old, blah, blah, blah. And then we find out what really was going on, that there was a cheese doodle that the dog all this Right, so in the dog's mind, he's simply guarding his food. Territory, right. And he might feel uh, imposed upon or threatened by a child coming up and entering his space and right. hugging or right. hugging him or touching him. I mean... Like we, you always talk about dogs only have one way to resolve conflict, and that's with their mouths. So right. they can't speak. They can't say, please right. don't do that. Right. Um, they can't put their hand up and say right. as a signal they, to step they, right. back. They can't call a mediator, can't call a lawyer, nor can they run away. So, yeah, so 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 that's very important. Or And they don't know what a child is. That right. child is just another creature. I think creature. that we assume that dogs understand the concept of children, and I think that's, but that's, that's a, a wrong assumption that... Is, is detrimental to a lot of dogs. Right. So we see dogs all the time, and we have to ask the owners, particularly when they're adults, if they weren't socialized properly. So in real estate, we talk about location, location, location. With animals, particularly dogs, domestic dogs, it's all about socialization, socialization, socialization. So, of course, that becomes a little tricky when we, re- we uh, adopt dogs or rescue dogs because we don't know their history. But but, but the point is, we can't make that assumption. So the old say, you know, I've been bitten by more dogs that supposedly don't bite. That was my mistake in stereotyping right? or ex- listening to the owner and expecting something. But we see this all the time. You talked about before, somebody with a beard, somebody with a hat. We've had, I've had dogs become aggressive towards people with epilepsy or they were taking some drugs or alcohol that dogs weren't familiar with. So it's all about what the dog's expectation is. So what you said, if a five-year-old child comes to just pet the dog, the dog is, his brain is saying, I'm on my, uh, I'm in my den and there's a cheese doodle that I have to survive on. Right. And I'm going to bite whatever. It doesn't matter who it is. It's not, it's not a moral act. It's not biting a child. It's biting a threat. Well, I think, People, a lot of people make the assumption that dogs understand what children are. And then, you know, we get calls all the time for uh, from people who have had a dog for a couple of years that, and then they have a baby. And then 
they start having issues. The dog has a difficult time acclimating to this new being that's in the household. Yeah. And I think it's it's wrong for people to make the assumption that the dog should just adapt and the dog should automatically know this is a baby. I need to be gentle. Right. They don't understand what a child is. They, right. And it's on the obligation of the owner to 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 teach the dog in dog language how what proper interaction is with a child in, coming into the right. home. We're taking an animal and trying to introduce them to a human world. So that includes tile, floors, whatever it is, mirrors, glass, couches, tables, refrigerators. I've had dogs guarding dishwashers and would attack the owners because there was dirty dishes in the dishwasher. Right. So Remember these are that. things that are we're oblivious to, but to the dog, he doesn't know what a dishwasher is. He just lays and sleeps in front of the dishwasher, and when somebody comes by, he bites him in the leg. And these aren't maulings. These are just dog bites, but they carry a lot of emotion. And when a dog bites a human, right. it's no different than a carpenter hitting his thumb with a hammer. But with it, if it comes to a dog bite, it carries a lot of emotional and nowadays litigious, you know, people want to right, sue over course, everything. Because I think we put a lot of we put a lot of emotional energy into our dogs and we expect things from them. And when they don't live up to that expectation, it is a very emotional experience. And especially if that is right, a dog bite, right. if if we have a right. child over our house, whether it's a guest or a new child into right. the, you know, it's a couple having a baby. If, if the dog doesn't act in a way that we think the dog should act, it becomes a very emotional experience right. for the owner. Right. And then sadly, this is how dogs end up in the yeah. shelters. Because just because a dog snapped at a kid doesn't mean he's aggressive a or vicious dog. at all. Right. It, but the doing... first instinct is to just get rid of the dog. Right. It's and to right. label the dog aggressive, right. but it's not wrong. good with children. And that's why we'll talk on another day why it's so bad and why our shelters are so filled. But yeah, so completely. And the other thing you have to understand that I think is most critical is that dogs are maturing seven times faster than we are. Right. So the 12-month-old dog could have been the most friendliest dog in the world. Right. But at five years old, it might have arthritis. It might be getting a little older and doesn't want to interact with a 10-year-old child, a 7-year-old child. So if you bet, pet a dog with, that has an ear infection, his only mechanism to, to, to uh, defend himself is his teeth, his canine teeth. Right. And they usually puncture your skin because that's what Mother Nature designed their jaws to rip skin open. So when we do, the very rare times we have accidents here or there's little dominance issues at our doggy daycare, it usually includes a, a puncture wound. Right. Which is nothing. It doesn't right. even require sutures. You can't really usually even suture a puncture wound. But the point is that's their teeth. And that's what they do. They kill, shake, and consume dead animals. They're predators. And that's what we do, Jackie, regardless if we're vegetarians or not. We're car carnivorous. Of course. All right. What, what do you want to say for All yourself? All right. So, well, it's time for the question of the day. Oh, boy. Okay. So, um, this comes from one of our customers who's had a frustration with letting their dog out and their dog not coming to them, right? So... We get calls a lot from people right. who say, I want my dog to be completely obedient. I let him out in the yard. I have f two minutes to let him out before I go to work. And I call him and he doesn't come. He completely defies me. What right. is the way to fix that? And But I think the way to answer that is to describe what the dog is, how the dog perceives the situation. Right. Yeah, so that's a very common question, right? And, and we have... You know, we have clients literally all over the country. And I have millionaires, billionaires that will call me and they'll say, Mike, I don't care or anything. I just want my dog to come to me when I call him. But what they're missing out is, number one, there's no such thing as training dogs for somebody else. A dog is going to look at you as the leader of the pack the leader and he's going to respond to the way you taught them so if you you have to teach a dog what calling him means right so, and so if you start to lure the dog in with food and all of these crazy things i hear every crazy uh method of trying to get their dog to come but right. most shaking the cookie box show, show, is right one of them. their leash picking up the leash but now you're negotiating and debating right with a dog so it's fundamentally wrong so there's ways of teaching a dog to come but they have to understand we usually start with a six foot leash but but the point is the dog is manipulating you right well the dog because i've experienced this with my own dog so to and you've said this the the dog thinks it's a game so they're not intentionally defying you 
They just don't understand that you're the leader and what you say goes right. because you haven't set that tone with them. Right. And it, you probably haven't been consistent with it. Exactly. So right. you start a negotiation. As I said, it's like you see it in children, three or four year old children right. that have temper tantrums and don't want to come. It's more fun. You go to the beach and you watch a three or four year old at the water line and mom says to come and the kid starts running the other way. What does mom do? Mom starts to run after the kid. Right. Which you know, is arguably appropriate or inappropriate. But the point of the matter is, if you're consistent, when you say a cue, you can speak in, doesn't matter what language, it's a sound. Dogs don't know words. They can't look words up in the dictionary. So you could say apple. And if apple means your dog is supposed to come towards you, that's what you teach the dog to do. Right, and I think you have to put in the hard work and you have to take the time to understand what the dog's perspective on all of this is and make that connection with him right. and not just expect that five minutes before you have to leave for work, your, your dog is just going to automatically right. understand what you want from right. him. Right. That's true. I don't know if it's hard work, it's consistency. So dogs need structure and consistency. So we boil it down with our dogs that you can snap your fingers and they're going to create a behavior associated with right. what you're doing at the time. Mm-hmm. Simple answer is having a dog teach your dog to come is very simple, but nobody can anybody who says they're going to train their dog for you to do that, I've never really seen it be that effective because you have the dog has to say you're my leader, I love you, you love me, you feed and shelter me, but I'm in danger. So just think of it from a pack of dogs. Subordinate members of the pack have to follow the leader. Their survival depends on it. So when you look, and I like, when you look at a flock of birds, a pack of dogs, a school of fish, they're not negotiating with one another. Right. The lead horse, when they go, runs and the subordinate members follow, and so this is part of nature. Right, and it, part of the challenge in a domestic environment is that if the human does not establish themselves as the leader of the pack in a way that the dog understands the dog looks at it as there is no leader i'm either going to take the leadership role or i'm going to live in this state of anxiety because i can't identify a leader so as humans we have that social structure too so just like children if a child was abandoned on the streets of new york when they were five years old they would have a difficult time surviving somewhere along the line an adult human would have to bring them into the fold and try to teach them things. But um, yeah, so, but without, you know, going on and on about it, it's a fundamental point. And when we talk about leadership, that doesn't mean yelling and screaming. Leadership is a state of mind and a physical presence. So dogs, by the way, don't talk to one another. They don't speak human language. They don't talk back and forth to one another, but they react to changes in movement in their environment. And that's something I think was really important to discuss in another episode, how dogs and humans react to the simplest changes of environment and how that affects their psychological well-being. Okay. Super interesting, kind of complex, I think, but you think it's simple because I think you, you, you've been doing this for so long. Mm. I think for other people, including myself, it can be challenging to think about this and, and apply it practically in everyday right. life, right? Because our brains are right. so used to right. interacting as humans but, that it's, it, but it's, it, it's, it's a good idea to just start thinking right. about these things. Right. So you're right. It's simple for me because my mind is simpler than yours, frankly. So you have an academic mind. So when I have people that struggle with this, I can almost predict what they do for a living. They're accountants, lawyers, scientists, doctors, nurses, people that are analyzing information. You're a former book writer and editor. That was your job. That, so that's how your brain is wired. Mine is just observing changes in my environment. Temperatures getting cold, and those are the things I'm in tune with. So it's not that I'm smarter. I'm actually, with my human intellect, is less than others, and it's, but I can relate to the dogs. Super interesting. All right. Well, we're going to wrap up this episode of The Dish on Dogs. And uh, thanks for listening, watching. Uh, Check us out on houndstownusa.com. We're also on iTunes, Spotify, all the regular podcast platforms. And we will be back next week. Very good. Take care. Thanks.